Hello and welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Laura. I'm Kate. And this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get you talking. Every episode, we sit down to chat about the book read most recently by one of our book clubs. What did we make of them? Did they spark debate? And whether we loved them or loathed them, the big question is always, were they great book club books? Today, we're talking about Prophets of Eternal Fjord by Danish-Norwegian author Kim Liner, which my book club read this past month. It's a historical novel set in the late 18th century that follows the life of one Morten Falk, a Christian missionary who is posted to a remote Danish colony in Greenland. And in our interview, we hear from Frances Ambler, Features Editor at O'Comely Magazine. She's recently set up the magazine's book club with the aim of championing new writing from female authors. I guess the thing about good magazines is that they do speak to you, regardless of where you are in the world, and you feel like you're part of a gang, which is like a nice book club thing too. So stay with us. All that and more coming up on the Book Club Review. So here we are again in the shed. It's a Monday night. It's the first time we've recorded in the evening. I was working today, but I've still got enough energy. I feel good. Oh, good. This is is actually quite a good recreation of my book club where people come after a long day of work and usually they're starving and exhausted. I should have provided wine and crisps. Yes, wine, maybe next time. Maybe afterwards we can have some wine as a reward. (laughs) You're allowed crisps later. Oh, excellent. (laughs) So, Prophets of Eternal Fjord. It's a title almost impossible to remember until you've read the book, after which you'll probably never forget it. Yeah, I think that's probably true. How did you choose this book, Kate? Well, I was actually the one who steered us towards this book. Um, It made the shortlist of the International Dublin Literary Award, which is a prize that I always go on about because I think it's so great. It's such a good book prize because all of the nominations come from libraries around the world. And I just think it's such an interesting way of flagging up things that you just don't come across anywhere else. And it's also quite a big prize. It's €100,000. And if it's a book in translation, then the author gets 75000 And the translator, in this case one Martin Aitken gets 25,000. Did it win? Uh, It's going to be announced on the 20th of June. So it's coming up. Watch the space. Watch the space. So Profits was nominated by three libraries. The Open Bar Bibliothèque in Belgium, who called it a novel full of lust, faith, calamity and persecution. The Aarhus Communes Bibliotheca in Denmark, who said it was a unique and compelling reading experience. And the Chicago Public Library, who said it was crafted in a way that forces the reader to feel the itch of crawling lice and smell the stench of rotten blubber. A brutal yet majestic novel that explores the complex relationship of the colonizer to the colonized. Now, I don't know about you, but they had me at lust, faith, calamity and persecution. (laughs) So that's the one we went for. But it is a long novel. And one of my guilty reading secrets is that actually I have a tendency, if a book isn't completely holding my attention, I'm quite happy to skim. I will just let my eyes slide down the page. And I found with this that I couldn't do that. It really demanded a certain kind of attention, a certain quality of attention. And so it was long and it was actually quite a challenging read. How did you find it? Quite a challenging read, you don't say. So last episode, I gave you grief because you hadn't finished the book. Just to put that in perspective, that was The Trouble with Goats and Sheep, which is probably about 240 pages and an incredibly easy read. Relatively light reading. Um, I only had this on my Kindle, so I'm not sure how many pages this book actually is. But I kept staring at the percentage (laughs) movement with dread. To be fair, and we'll get into this, not the entire book. There There were 70 to 80 percent, I tell you, it dragged and dragged and dragged. Um, Really? You found it dragged? But I finished it. Well, that's good. Congratulations. Pure spite. (laughs) So it centers around the character of Morton Falk, and he follows his father's wishes and he trains to be a priest. So the first part of the book is in Copenhagen, and we're following his education and his journey of sort of self-discovery sexual awakening maybe yeah, we could say yeah that's that's yeah. okay so there's that and then he goes to greenland and there's this long ocean voyage where he is with a crew of men who are sailing who make this journey frequently and the cow he has decided to <laughs> take with him to to sort of export import into greenland and then he gets to greenland and then 
it all goes terribly wrong. Yes, there's a sort of arc of just this real loss of innocence and idealism as he comes to terms with what life out there is like and the relationship between the Danish colonisers and the colonised, the native Greenlanders, the Inuit, who are there. And the prophets of the title are a native couple who have been Christianized. they have been converted to Christianity, and they have a settlement further up the coast. And the woman starts to believe that she's receiving visions from God, from Jesus. Mm -hmm. And she follows these visions and they start to actually improve life in this settlement. They take the settlement away from the water and up onto the plateau mm, where there's, the fells. there's cleaner air and it's just a better place to live. And they start to come up with different ways of organizing the community and sharing the resources more fairly. And actually they start to live rather better. Yeah, much more successfully. And this is shortly after there's been a terrible famine um, where the, the Danish colonizers do not help the natives. Yeah, I mean, life is, life is very harsh and it's difficult to carve out an existence there. And the author paints this very vividly. The whole thing is framed by this very shocking opening, oh, which yes. features a woman who's known as the widow. And she is standing on a cliff and she is waiting to be pushed off to her death. And the person who approaches behind her to push her off, you come to understand, was the priest, Morton Falk. And it's unclear whether this is something that she is complicit in and that's something that she wants to happen. There's a suggestion that that's the case. Or if what you're witnessing is plain and simple murder. And the novel opens with this. I mean, on pages one and two of this mm, novel, mm -hmm. this is how you go into it. Mm -hmm. And then it goes back to Copenhagen when he's just arrived at the age of 26. That's right. So it, it, there's no gentle introduction. You are plunged straight in mm -hmm. to the, the sort of sorts of things that go on in this novel. And I don't know. I mean, I just from the very beginning, I was completely captivated. I just was so intrigued. I don't, and, and horrified. I think captivated and horrified <laughs> sort of sum up how I how I negotiated this book. I have decided I do not hate this book, but I did hate reading it. Mm, interesting. Really hated reading it. There's oh, a... I'm sorry it was so long. <laughs> so long. Yeah. It, it is an incredibly visceral novel. And I didn't, to be fair, I didn't really hate it to begin with, but it just gets under your skin. And I've never read a book that pays more attention to bodily functions. That's right. And like the atrocities that humans can inflict upon each other That's in right. the greatest detail possible. So I'm not going to really get into it but if we just want a few a few key words from my notebook because I just I've never come across them it's credit to the translation that they managed to find the right words greasy orifices seeping bed sores pungent chemistry of foulness greasy oh, more greasy <laughs> squelching breasts I mean the language fetid rank fug accumulated fluids mm. It's just stomach churning. Yeah, I was I, I was going to read a passage, but it's hard to pick out any passage you can read in isolation that isn't quite long. <laughs> but um, I've got a little quote here from when Falk is settling himself into the ship that's going to carry him to Greenland. And uh, it says, he tests the bunk and then seats himself on the stool and examines the mattress, prodding gently. The lice seep forth oh. like water. He withdraws his hand in a hurry. Here, I'm asleep, he thinks with a shudder. I mean, the lice. The lice. The lice are everywhere. And I did wonder, would people have been that aware of the filth that surrounded them? Because humans become accustomed to their surroundings very, very quickly. Mm, well, this was sort of slightly Sally's point. She said, you know, was it really that bad? <laughs> and if it was, would you really notice? Like, uh, certainly with smell, you stop smelling things very quickly because you become used to them. Yeah, but I mean, it wouldn't be much of a, an interesting novel if you know, the <laughs> author took for granted the fact yeah. that you knew what a completely fetid river of sewage oh, running God. along a gutter that you had just Ooh. stepped in, if you just assumed that you knew what that was like. I mean, one of, the, one of the things I think was so wonderful about this book was the author's facility to sort of describe these things in such a way that you kind of felt like you were there. Like you were just like you're going to sick. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, you, you mentioned Sally had a problem with that. Sally's in your book club. Tell me, what did the book club think of it? Well, it was quite a heated discussion. With Sally in particular, the issue for her was the treatment of women in this book. There's a woman in the colony. Her name is Madame Kragstadt, and she is the trader. So the trader is effectively the sort of governor of the colony and she is his wife and she's a tragic figure when she goes there she's sort of a bit like a butterfly she's sort of beautiful and she Excited. has pretty dresses you and... get the sense she's probably quite young yeah like no more than like 18 even and she's sort of brutally destroyed by the environment and the humans who mm, live within the that men. environment but wasn't it realistic that i mean that's the trouble because i too i i despised almost all of the male characters because they're incredibly unlikable and the way that they talk and think about women that uh, that is peppered throughout the novel is it just it's just repulsive you know they're, they're talking about you know well men don't become prostitutes because they're not as lustful as women and you're like what yeah what? and 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 morton is constantly disgusted by the women who seem to be sort of throwing themselves at him but they're all desperate figures who are almost like kind of drowning in circumstance yeah it's really tricky because there is a kind of certain ambiguity in the way he writes about these women Madame Kragstadt is raped by the smith in the colony and she becomes pregnant with his child and she then has to get rid of that child. And the scene Good in Lord. which Falk attempts to sort of help her out with this is I actually couldn't read it. It was just I had to put my hand over my eyes and actually Robert in my book club was the same. I mean, he, like me, in its, in its uh, sort of almost like crazy over the top exaggeration of the awfulness of these events i mean there was just something quite i don't know entrancing about it but at the same time there were definitely scenes that were almost impossible to read and you sort of think is the author kind of maybe enjoying this a bit too much there's yeah. a sort of certain sense that he was reveling in it and also that there was definitely more than a suggestion that madame kragstadt had in a certain way, been responsible for arousing mm. the you Smith so. to the degree that he then did yeah. what he did. Yeah. And that's very, very difficult to to read and mm. to condone and to justify. And Sally mm. was just, I think, angry about mm. that actually. And it was it was it was it was something that really she finished it and she commented on its artistry, I suppose, in a way. You know, she admired the writing and the way the novel had been structured and the it, scale of, I suppose, of the ambition perhaps the and scope the of it of place yes and time but, but, and history. but for her she just couldn't get past that my argument was that i was shocked by the treatment of women but the widow who is arguably the strongest female character in this book and the central female character in this book she's a victim but at the same time she is a person who is an incredibly strong female character. She's the brightest and she is the best at surviving. And actually, she changes as a character. Early on, she, when we meet her, she has this kind of fatalistic desire to die. She just doesn't really want to live. Later on, she wants to die, but for a very specific reason. Mm -hmm. And she has a plan that she puts into effect in order to achieve her aim. Mm -hmm. And so the fact is that in the, at the centre of this novel is a strong female character. I, I can completely see why Sally had an issue with lots of the portrayals of the Greenlanders and also of the women. But the author toes a very fine line where when it shifts perspective, it's almost all, entirely told from the third person, but he does focus on specific characters at different points. And when he shifts, say, from Morton Fox's perspective to the widow's perspective, which is only very brief, I think, but you, you get a very different story about her relationship with her daughter, for example. Mm -hmm. And when uh, it shifts from Morton Fox's perspective to Bertel's perspective, who's the catechist to Morton Fox. That's right. Who is my favourite character. Yeah, so he's, Bertel is the native Greenlander who has become a Christian who has studied and he helps Falk he interprets Falk's sermons so that they can be understood by the Greenlanders. Because one of the funny things is that Falk, he's, he's all fired up to learn 
Greenlandic but mm. he is unable to because no one will really talk to him and so <laughs> we've been calling he never it, gets anywhere with it we've been calling it a colony which sounds quite grand it's actually like a, a settlement of maybe no more than 50 to 100 people all of the danish settlers think that the inuit have no facial expressions and no thoughts and are just blank whereas actually they have an incredibly rich intellectual and emotional life Bertel and his relationship with his wife and his love for his son and the challenges as the son's getting older and wants to do more things that might put his health at risk. I felt, I felt like those scenes could appear in any book at any time. They were so sweet and domestic and the little strain of being a parent. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the other victims in a way in this novel, innocent victims, are the children mm. who are incredibly vulnerable and indeed are rarely spared terrible events that befall them whether mm. it's dying from natural causes or whether it's dying from horrible accidents or whether it's, well, it's being abused abused so to me the women and children in this novel represented beautiful fragile things that should have been protected but weren't mm -hmm. and i thought that the author used that it's embedded in this novel and i just thought that was really important yeah, I think that's true because the men are almost all villains and maybe that I maybe that is a, a reason why I do have a problem with this novel too is that most of the characters are very very flat. There's no backstory, there's no understanding of why they might do the things they do. You know, the tra Trader Craigster is just bad. The Smith is just bad. But you don't know why. It's I, just because they can. I just, I actually don't agree with that. I mean, I agree that there's a certain blankness particularly with the main character with Morton Falk and Andy was quite funny about him he was like yeah I thought this was going to be a really interesting story following this quite dynamic individual who seems to be full of ideas and and then he just goes to Greenland and doesn't really do anything and doesn't really achieve anything <laughs> and except then, loses all his teeth falls to pieces and then comes back and, and he said and I just didn't really find that very interesting I absolutely felt the opposite I just felt that in that blankness you projected i felt like he wasn't fully described because you were being invited to identify with him the whole time but he's so unlikable or his views on things are so unlikable and unnuanced but you see this is the thing i i felt like as a portrait of human nature and the ambiguity of human nature mm. you know we talked when we discussed secondhand time by svetlana Alexievich, which is an account of life in in soviet russia we talked about how the first thing to go humanity sort of disappears when there's hunger and suffering and and i thought this was a novel that explored that in a really interesting way and i i found i could identify with it you know falk he tries to do the right thing when the occasion demands it he does his best he sort of does everything always backfires so catastrophically and he never really succeeds at anything but again i felt like that was sort of human endeavor and I don't know. even in Copenhagen though before anything has gone wrong in his life he's totally amoral and has no empathy or ability to you know um, befriend or have a relationship with other, with other human beings yeah he's a bit strange but then the the precursor to that again we're sort of invited to understand him because it's explained quite early on that he all lost of his siblings all of his siblings except for so one. he was one of two surviving siblings out of seven mm. and there's a haunting little scene where it's it's described the way that he would sit with each successive sibling as they died and there was this mm. alcove this niche in the family house and he would lie there and there's a line about how their smiles would gradually stiffen into death and then the little corpse would be carried away and then the next one mm. would and he grew up in this atmosphere of death and you get the sense of this child who learned that they had to lock themselves away because everything was just so awful and precarious and that there was no point in making connections with people. And so again, I totally accept your point about him. I I, I think that is true. That's very kind of you. But at the same time, I felt like the author had totally covered that. And, and I, what I liked about this book is I just, I just felt it, it was so masterful the way that he took you into this world. And he, to, to, for me, he never dropped me out of it. I was there the whole way. I never had any doubts because I understood because he'd explained to me why things were the way that they were. And I, I just really admired that. 
And yet, did you have any sense of the land? Because I found it, it should almost be like a, a, the main character, you know, the, the, green, the green land, uh, the fells and the snow. And I just didn't have any sense of the surroundings other than kind of the immediate impact on, on the human. There's no descriptions of beautiful vistas or well, mountains. Or... We had quite a funny discussion about this because Robert said it made him want to go to Greenland. And I was like, really? This made you want <laughs> to, to go fair, to Greenland? It made, it made me want to go to Greenland too. I think I'm just fascinated by it. You too? It. Yeah. I really like places where there are no people. Right. Well, it's, as a tourist advertisement for Greenland, I'm not sure I would press <laughs> Prophets oh. of Eternal Fjord on anyone's hands. But no, and again, I, I don't agree. I, I suspect, I haven't been there, the landscape of Greenland is quite stark. There are no trees. It's just plateaus and tundra and it's cold and there are lakes and rivers. And I actually found I could imagine it quite well. I mean, it's more you sort of experience it. It's not described for you. Mm, it, it's going back to that way that he that's uses That's a really good sensation. way to put it. Yes, exactly. You experience it. So you experience the cold, you experience the smells, you experience how it affects you because he goes into such detail about the sensations that all the human, char human characters, all the characters <laughs> are going through. So was it a good book club book? I think it would depend very much on the book club. It would need to be a book club who were up for long demanding books which this is and tolerant of people not finishing that book i would say yeah i can't imagine anyone starting this book and not wanting to finish it it's really oh my god it's just <laughs> so dreary I don't you want to you wouldn't you, you want to know what happens don't you no. and, and 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 i uh... well you do know that i think that's what really bothered me is that at the very beginning they go forward in time and hook you great okay then it goes back in time it goes up to a certain point skips forward four years and then tells you everything that happened and then goes back to take you through those events. So mm. there's no narrative tension anymore. Well, but I thought the jumping around in time was quite an effective device because you meet these characters in certain situations and then you see the things that change them. And it's dramatic. It's sort of high. I mean, instead of, I think, yeah, if this novel had just been written as like one slow page by page linear narrative, it would have been a lot less interesting. One of the things I admired so much about this was the completely unexpected way that it was put together. I was always guessing. I never quite knew what I was going to read next. I didn't know where I was going to be. And yet, at the same time, it for me, it hung together beautifully. I thought it was completely coherent. I was never at a loss to know when I was or where I was because I think the author did such a good job of describing it. But, I mean, as you're probably sensing, and it's just really <laughs> interesting to hear, you know, which sort of camp you're in, because Robert and I were sort of united in our enthusiasm for it. And Andy, Sally and Amanda, I think, were much more measured. <laughs> very, <laughs> but they varying finished it. degrees of disgust and dislike. One other point I made was that um, I felt like I had been primed to read this novel. I'd almost had training because I had previously read The North Water by Ian McGuire. Oh, okay. which I've actually recommended on this podcast as a book club book. It, it's got all the kind of gutsy viscerality and, and sort of horror of prophets, but in a much shorter dose. So as I said, I, I felt like I kind of had training in, <laughs> in, in not being too shocked by things. All right. So maybe this would be a great book club book, but it entirely depends on your book club. I think... I'm going to have to say I recommend it as a read mm. for anyone, but I wouldn't recommend it as a book club book. I think ultimately it wasn't a great success. Or at least with a big giant red proceed with caution. Yeah, perhaps. Perhaps that. As I say, it would just very much depend on the book club and, and what they were what they were up for. You know, if you want to be challenged and excited and... Filled with loathing. And forced to sort of expand your ideas and, and, and feel stretched and invigorated. I mean, to me, I, I, I just felt sort of thrilled by this. I, I For me, it felt like a real discovery. Um, but yeah, what do I know? <laughs> <laughs> it's lucky we have book clubs to help me figure these things out. That's definitely what they're good for. Kate and I love our book clubs, but we also love finding out about other people's. I talked to Frances Ambler, who's the features editor at the indie lifestyle magazine O'Cumley, about setting up a book club for their readers. It's still early days, but their policy of featuring new writing from women authors is already offering up some real gems. 
our audience are mainly young women in their early 20s who are very creative, very arty and interested in the world around them. Now, we know each other because you have been a longtime member of my book club uh, and you've been in book clubs before as well. So tell me a little bit about why you decided to bring that experience to the magazine. It's mainly because the magazine covers lots of arts subjects like film and music and it's always struggled a bit with how to do books, I guess, because they don't have the same hype that comes out with a film, with a release. You don't kind of go to the cinema, so you don't buy a book the second it's released, very rarely. And because we are a magazine that has so much interaction with our readers, the two seem to lend it themselves to each other. In our surveys, time and time again, it's like, what do you like doing with your spare time? And our readers say, read books. So, great. <laughs> Yeah, I really like the sound of your readers. <laughs> Spare time, go go to go to parties, go, go shopping. No, no, no. Sit at home alone and read some good books. I know, ideal, ideal magazine readers, exactly. I guess the thing about good magazines is that they do speak to you, regardless of where you are in the world, and you feel like you're part of a gang, which is like a nice book club thing too. And the book club is new. Yes, it is. We did one book and we're just going to print with our second book. That's The Lucky Ones by Julianne Pacheco. How did you choose it? How do you decide which books to read? It's a very good question. I think at the moment it's kind of evolving. So the first couple we've done have actually both been debut books. Again, like with the other coverage, we often do people who are kind of emerging, who you may not have heard of yet. So it's also that they're debut books by young women. Uh, I mean, there has been a bit of discussion about whether we should do classics. We talked about whether we should do The Handmaid's Tale. But in the end, we have a regular feature in the magazine called What We're Reading, and they tend to be old books. So we kind of, at the moment, we've decided to keep the What We're Reading to the older books and then make the book club all about new talents and new books. So tell me how the book club works. In the issue, we announce what our next book club book is going to be. And then we encourage readers to either email us or tweet or Instagram or comment on our Facebook page using our hashtag OCO book club. Any comments they have about the book or any questions they may have regarding the book because ahead of the issue coming out, we meet with the author of the book, we have a chat with the author and then the next issue we publish an array of people's comments, we publish some of our own thoughts on the book and we have an in-depth interview with the author in which we can ask her any questions that have been raised and get to know a bit about her. And then if you've read the book, you can read that interview with the satisfaction of reading it along with us. So if you're interviewing the author, do you feel like your readers might hold back some of their more challenging opinions? That's a very good question. And actually, I think to date, perhaps... We are missing some of that to and fro debate because people's comments have tended to be positive. I mean, they're very good books, but I wonder if it was in a physical space whether people would have more debate and more to and fro, whereby we found to date the comments are quite basic, as in, I loved it, and occasionally a bit more, but perhaps you don't get that to and fro that is part of the joy of a good book club meeting. Actually, I'm quite impressed that no one has maybe trolled the book. I think that's probably credit to your readers because online communities aren't always the kindest place. I know, and I have to say our readers are very sweet and lovely. And I think if someone did come up in the midst of it and started trolling the book, I'd be like, you're not a reader of ours. <laughs> you just come here to make trouble. Be gone. Be gone. They're very, very lovely readers. So, yeah, we're very lucky in that regard. Have you chosen your next book? Yes, it's The Idiot by Elif Batuman, and she is a writer for The New Yorker, but this is her first fiction book, and it's a coming-of-age book about the woman of Turkish heritage going to Harvard with the ambitions of being a writer, and I have yet to read it, so I'm looking forward to reading it, but everyone I know who's read it has given it quite rave reviews, so I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Francis, for sitting down with me. The edition of O'Cumley will be out on the 8th of June for anyone who wants to see the posts and online engagement with Julianne Pacheco's The Lucky Ones. How else can people get involved? Twitter and Instagram, O'Cumley Mag, and use the hashtag Oco Book Club, and then you can see what people are saying and people are posting, and just say hello to us. 
so that was interesting. I've got the O'Cumley magazine here, and it's quite interesting looking at the comments that they've published for the last one. I have to say they are all quite positive and yeah enthusiastic i mean it's a book club in the sense of bringing people together to read the same thing and getting people to read something that they might not otherwise have read and as francis says the ambition is to bring people together in person because they know that it's a challenge to recreate that on the page yeah i don't know i think that i feel like they might have a lot more fun with it if they did long dead authors and uh, you know they allowed their readers to really let rip but then <laughs> it, in terms then, they, of, then they can't interview them yeah that's true <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of an insight into the sort of community of of people who read this magazine which francis obviously has quite a strong sense of i mean i was kind of smiling to think of what they'd make of Profits of oh, Term of Fjord. I know, I know. But yeah. well, I'm, you know what? I think they're very smart, intelligent women. They might hate it just as much as me. Yeah. Or, or well, they might love it just well, as much as you. And that's quite interesting because, again, that's the kind of book where you couldn't just say something nice like, oh, you're so excited oh, to be reading this. No, you know? no, you couldn't. So I think, it, I think it, it does sort of, for me, highlight the challenge of trying to, yeah, trying to have a book club with a magazine where there's obviously a relationship with the authors and the publishers that they're featuring. Or I wondered if they maybe, instead of just inviting general comments, is my... Mm. <laughs> I'm always kind of thinking, well, how could you improve things? <laughs> but I think it was Emily's idea that she had with her walking book club mm. was that she would give her walkers themes or particular ideas to consider. Okay. And perhaps if they yeah, were, were giving their readers a particular question to consider as they read the book, they might then get more interesting and more varied responses. Well, you know, I think it's just in its infancy. So it's only going to go from strength to strength. They're choosing some brilliant books. Yes. The next one they're doing... Um, the... the Idiot by Aleph Batuman. Yeah, it was one that I had already kind of come across and thought, oh, that looks really interesting. I was really intrigued by her previous book, which is about her wanderings, uh, tracing uh, her interest in Russian literature. And I just thought it sounded really fascinating. And so I think this is a novel based on the same idea. So yeah, it sounds... And I've read a few short stories in The Lucky Ones so far. Um, I actually turned to the, the Lucky Ones as a break from Prophets of Eternal Fjord. <laughs> the writing is very light and I really enjoy her style, but it's, it's pretty heavy stuff too because it's in Colombia when there's a lot of kidnappings going on and a lot of civil disturbances. So it's not... It, I put it down. It was, not a, it was not a happy break, so I paused. Mm. I will go back to it though. I think the other thing is that the book club is one part of a little section in their magazine which is devoted to books which actually if I was reading the magazine and I got to it I would be really like oh great you know a whole section about books and, and as a part of that it's a little bit of a different way of engaging with books that is quite nice so yeah it would be really interesting to see how it develops. It's a beautiful magazine I think if anyone can get their hands on it uh, they definitely should. What to read next is always one of our favorite things to think about. Inspired by Prophets of Eternal Fjord here are a few more recommendations you might want to consider for your next book club. I'm very excited to have an excuse to recommend Days Without End by Irish author Sebastian Barry. I loved this book. It was published, I think, in, earlier in the year, maybe end of last year. Have you read it yet? Yeah, I did read it, actually. I read it while I was away last week. Did you love it? <laughs> <laughs> I, it was really good, yeah. Um, I thought it was J.D. Salinger meets no, Louis ignore her. Ignore her. No, I didn't. We could, we, could have our own, we could have a whole other podcast around Days Without End. But let me tell you a little bit about why you should read it. It is one of the most beautiful historical novels I've ever read. And it's very moving. And for me, it's everything that Prophets of Eternal Fjord isn't. You know, the similarities here. So we have Tom McNulty, who's fled the Irish famine as a young teenage boy. All of his family have perished around him. He's gone through this traumatic experience crossing the Atlantic Ocean, um, arrived in America with nothing. And he enlists in the army along with his best friend and, and actually his lover, the love of his life. And it's the story of their time together as soldiers and just the atrocities really that were committed by the American army against the Sioux warriors and the native people of America. But what I loved about Days Without End is that these characters retain so much humanity and so much understanding and that everyone feels like a well-rounded human being. Um, I highly recommend it. I think it would make for an amazing book club. Um, and Kate and I are probably going to chat about it for another half hour after this. <laughs> and I'm recommending The Blue Flower by Penelope Fitzgerald. 
which is set in a similar time period, 1794, and it follows a young man, Fritz, who falls in love. The only problem is that the object of his affection is a 12-year-old girl named Sophie. Have you read this novel? No, it oh. sounds problematic. No, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. It's a, it's a masterpiece. It's based on a true story about the early years of the German romantic poet and philosopher Novalis. Like Lina, it brings the past vividly to life, and life back then was precarious and short. But this is a beautiful, warm novel that really brings out the details of family life and relationships. I can't recommend it highly enough. And I do think there's lots to discuss. I think it would make a great book club book. It's interesting, though, that we've both, in reaction to Prophets of Eternal Fjord, we, we've both gone for books that are suffused by sort of warmth and humanity. Mm. I think, yeah, that's probably what you need after reading King Lyman. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. And before they disappeared off home after our last meeting, Robert and Sally from my book club gave us their recommendations. Yeah, I'm not sure it kind of completely links in, but the kind of boat trip did make me think very much of the journey that they have in the novel Forever War, which was inspired by the Vietnam War, but it's kind of set in a futuristic world where they're having a war with kind of aliens and all these soldiers, men and women, they're on a ship together. And then when they get there, they have the battle. Then when he comes back, everyone has kind of changed gender and everyone is is homosexual and he as a straight person is is very much the outsider and then the ultimate end of it is um where everyone is a clone and the clones understand each other and the traditional humans are very much out of it and probably better off out of it as well because all they want to do is kill each other so he just made me think of that and kind of the different clash of cultures and very much um a similar thing in terms of greenlanders versus the danish I think it has a different perspective about how um, cultures move on, how kind of the idea of gender is a kind of social construct as much as it is kind of like a, a natural thing. And there's lots to discuss in it. I gave my little synopsis and no one liked it. So <laughs> I, think, I think that's probably a good sign that kind of maybe that would be a good discussion. I think it sounds perfect. And Sally, you had something that you were going to recommend that I had never heard of. What was that? I would recommend To the Ends of the Earth trilogy by William Golding, which is set on a transport ship to Australia in the early 19th century. And so, again, deals with sort of issues of class and sort of savagery coming up on an enclosed, tight space where nobody can escape because they're stuck in the middle of the ocean. And it's a really fascinating, involving read I mean I loved it and I think there would be a lot to discuss about it and I could see why some people might not like it as much as I have which is always a, actually quite a good thing for book club well that's all for today thanks for listening everyone for our next episode we'll be discussing The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead it's been scooping up all the awards the Pulitzer the National Book Award and Andrew Carnegie Medal it's also an Oprah's book club book too it's the story of two African-American slaves fleeing north to freedom. But here, the metaphorical Underground Railroad is reimagined as a real secret railroad helping slaves escape to freedom in the north. I can't wait to read it. Yeah, I'm excited to read it too. I just bought my copy at the very wonderful Shakespeare & Co. bookshop in Paris. And I saw from their events program that he's actually going to be there talking about it on June the 20th, I think. Feels like a good excuse to head back down there. Yeah. Just want an excuse to go back to Paris. <laughs> well, if you're interested to see what I get up to in Paris, you can follow us on Instagram at the Book Club Review. You can drop us a line at thebookclubreview at gmail.com. And if you're not already, why not subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts? But for now, thanks for listening and happy reading. <laughs>